Okay, what we're going to do in this lesson is chapter 5, which is verbs, and chapter 6 continues on uh, with the uh, being able to use verbs correctly in a sentence. Um, so they do work congruently one with the other. In the first uh, example, beginning in chapter 5, it's present and past participle. Um, you must understand that the four par uh, principal parts of the verbs, the present tense, the past tense, the past participle, and the present participle. Um, in the present participle, these uh, words right here are regular and irregular verbs is used by forming the ing or adding the ing to the present tense of the verb. The present participle must be preceded by one or more helping verbs uh, and are usually the forms of the verb to be, such as am, is, are, was, were, be, and been. So, here is uh, an ing word. Prepare is the original form of the verb, and it's just adding ing into it to make it uh, in the present participle, and it's preceded by um, a helping verb. So Olivia is preparing for her interview, um, and then I am writing, so it's preceded by a helping verb and an ing word. So that's the example of the present participle. Past participle happened in the past and is preceded by one of the have verbs and it's uh, formed by adding D or ED to the end of the verb. So now Olivia has researched the company meaning in the past since it's already occurred. Uh, so they added ED to make it past tense and then have a, a form of the, uh, the past participle such as have, has, or had. I have called many companies, indicating that it happened in the past. Uh, so there's the present participle and the past participle. And one of the uh, areas where we do have a little bit of a problem is sometimes we just make it too wordy. It doesn't mean that it's incorrect. Uh, it's just a little bit wordy and we can actually improve upon it. Uh, for example, here are some awkward participial uh, phrases. Uh, first one is, Ava's having been promoted to the office manager was cause for celebration. Having been promoted, that's grammatically correct, but it's a little bit wordy. So Ava's promotion to office manager was cause for celebration certainly is much less wordy and has a better impact for the reader. Uh, being as you live, anytime you have being as, try to avoid that particular uh, structure. Uh, change it to the word because and make it a dependent clause. Uh, because you live nearby, should we carpool? That makes it much easier for the reader. So that's really the whole purpose of uh, clarifying the uh, participial phrases instead of using being as or, or being that. Uh, change it to something that's going to be easy for the reader. The second part is a verbal, and the verbal comes in three different parts. The verbal um, is, can be a gerund, and gerunds focus specifically on nouns that typically end or do end in ing. Uh, the second one is infinitives. Infinitives is the word to plus a verb. And then you have participles, which are considered to be verbal adjectives. They describe and they may end with d, e, d, or ing. So a gerund ending in ing, uh, a participle ending in d, e, d, or ing that describes what someone's doing, how to deal with that. And then finally, the infinitive, to plus a verb. Never split them. Always keep those together. Okay, so here's some examples of gerunds that end with ing that's used as a noun. So if I say, I am marketing my products, um, and marketing is a verb phrase, that's uh, very well recognized as a verbal for a verb phrase right there. So if I just said marketing our products on the web is necessary, now the word marketing is no longer used as a verb. It's changed the form to a noun that ends with ing. So marketing our products is our complete subject. And then the verb is is. So marketing our products is. Right here we have ing word, reveal is uh, I am revealing a new product line. It's obviously an action verb there, I am revealing. So to uh, whenever it changes form, like for example, an ing word is in a prepositional phrase, it's definitely not functioning as a verb in that particular case. And uh, so the subject is Travis insisted 
And then on revealing the code is part of the prepositional uh, phrase. So um, in this case, the ing is functioning as the object of a preposition. Now, mainly with gerunds, always follow this rule. Make any noun or pronoun that precedes, which it doesn't occur in this particular case, but make any noun or pronoun modifying a gerund possessive. Show possession, because we sometimes fail to recognize gerunds as nouns. We fail to make their modifiers possessive. So instead of saying Amelia resented him calling during lunch, it's not him that she resented. Now, if we just said Amelia resented him, that would be correct. We wouldn't say Amelia resented his. So Amelia resented him because that's who she resented. Now there's an action with ing that is now changed to a noun. What did she really resent? She didn't resent him. She resented what he did, his calling during lunch. So make the uh, noun or pronoun before the ing word possessive. Okay, then secondly, the manager appreciated uh, you working. No, they don't appreciate you. They appreciate what you did. They appreciated your working late. So we make the pronoun preceding the ing word possessive. And then finally, we don't object to Curtis. We object, object to his action. We object to his smoking. So we need to make the noun or the pronoun possessive before the ing word. That's usually the greatest challenge with gerunds, is using the possessive case pronoun. So make special note of that. Infinitives, much easier to recognize. You have to plus a verb. Avoid splitting them, that's the key thing. Don't say try to and then have the word and separating the word to from a, um, a verb. If you have a verb in there, it's not going to be part of a prepositional phrase anyway. If I said, let's go to the mall, then to the mall is a prepositional phrase. This special construction is to plus a verb. So try to call, not try and call. Be sure to speak, not be sure and speak softly. So this is awkward as well. This is very awkward. Noah wanted to if he could find the time, take the online class. Notice the split infinitives. Avoid those. Keep that to and take together. If he could find time, comma, Noah wanted to take the online course. Never split your infinitives. Keep to plus a verb closely related to each other. In the past, we have always forbidden any type of separation with the word to plus a verb. We're a little bit more relaxed with it now. If I uh, had the word to completely uh, take, to completely take the Christmas tree down. That word completely is an awkwardly split infinitive. To take is really what it's saying, to completely take the Christmas tree down. Uh, now, we're a little bit more lax with that one if it's just one word, if it's not too much of a split. But try to do your best uh, to take down the Christmas tree completely. Put the word completely at the end to clarify it a little bit better. Okay, also avoid uh, misplaced verbal modifiers. Some of these can be a little bit humorous. And let's look at some of these at the bottom. For example, here's an ing word that's not... If I said I slipped on the ice, that slipped is an action verb. So we take the word slip and then put the ing on it, slipping on the stairs. Now it's describing what somebody did. It says his ankle was injured. So it appears that his ankle, ankle slipped on the stairs, which is untrue. So put your modifier as close to the verbal phrase as possible. Another situation is anytime that your verbal phrase is introductory, always offset it with a comma and its modifier, the noun or pronoun, should immediately reflect on the verbal phrase. So slipping on the stairs, who slipped? He did. And as a result, he injured his ankle. That's why the second one is better. The next one, opening my iPad, his message came up immediately. It looked like the message opened the iPad. That's illogical. 
Um, I am the one that opened my iPad. So opening my iPad, I saw his message immediately. So this is the modifier right here referring to the verbal phrase to which it refers. Keep your nouns or your pronouns immediately as close to the introductory verbal phrase as possible. There's some other fun ones on the next page. Okay, skilled in social media. Here's an ED ending word. I am skilled in the action verb in that particular case. But now, skilled in social media, that's describing someone. The personnel director hired Liz McGrath. So it looks like the personnel director was, is skilled in social media. Um, completely opposite of what it should be. Actually, Liz McGrath is the one that's skilled, and the personnel director is the one that hired her. So let's put Liz closer to the one, the modifier, the verbal phrase that's needing modified. Liz is skilled in social media. That's why she was hired by the personnel director. Okay, then misplaced verbal phrases in other positions. Some of them can be dangling and some of those could be misplaced. If the modifier is considered to be dangling, that means it's not there. We don't know who the, uh, the modifier is, which makes that very awkward. Uh, but it can also be misplaced. If it's misplaced, that's what can make it a little bit funny sometimes. So I love this one. This is a misplaced um, modifier. The missing purchase orders were found by his assistant lying in the top desk drawer. So how many assistants can you actually get into the top desk drawer is really what that's saying. Obviously, that's not what we really want to say. We want to say his assistant found the missing purchase orders lying in the top desk drawer. It's the purchase orders that's in the desk drawer, not the assistant. So see how some of those can, especially the misplaced modifiers, can be a little bit funny. The modifier's there, it's just misplaced. Here's another fun one. Doctors discovered that the patient's wrist had been fractured in five places during surgery. So did the surgeons, uh, did they uh, have malpractice as a result of breaking his, his uh, wrist in five places during surgery? No. Misplaced modifier. So we're going to say during surgery, comma, doctors discovered that the patient's wrist had been fractured in five places. During surgery, they discovered that that had happened. So much better in the second choice. That brings us to the verb moods in the next area. And there's three verb moods, moods that we're going to discuss in this chapter. The first is indicative, second is imperative, and the third is subjunctive. And notice the spelling of subjunctive. S-U-B-J-U-N-C-T-I-V-E has no relation to a subjective case pronoun. Subjective case pronouns, S-U-B-J-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, completely different. This is verbs, not the pronouns. Uh, the indicative expresses a fact and probably ends with a period. Um, we need the contract period. Indicative mood expresses a fact. The imperative mood expresses a command, which is usually missing a noun or a pronoun. So the understood you is generally the subject of an imperative statement. So if it, express, if it expresses a command, send the contract immediately. Who? You. You send the contract immediately. So it's a command. Uh, whenever you're putting together a, um, a manual on how to uh, print a document, you will likely use the imperative mood. So the subjunctive case moods expresses a doubt, a conjecture, or a suggestion. Um, and it usually has the words if and wish, W-I-S-H, if and wish. Okay, with those particular words, that usually suggests something that's clearly contrary to fact. If that be the case, then you should use the subjunctive case verb were. Now, we typically don't do that in real life. If we have a singular subject, we use a singular verb. For example, I was in the office earlier today. Singular subject with a singular verb. 
But if I add the word if in front of that, if I was or were in the office today, I would have completed the purchase orders. But obviously I'm not. So instead of using the verb was, because it goes along with the singular subject I, I'm gonna change that to the subjunctive case verb were. So if I were in the office uh, today, I would have completed those purchase orders. Use the subjunctive case verb were or be. Those are the two subject, subjunctive case verbs to suggest a, a, something that's contrary to fact, uh, something that is a conjecture, a doubt, or a suggestion. Furthermore, we want to uh, use a subjunctive mood in clauses that express a doubt, conjecture, or a suggestion. Some of those clauses begin with the words if and wish, which we've already talked about. And uh, furthermore, if we're doubtful or contrary to fact, and it's introduced by the word if, as if, or wish, use the subjunctive for form were rather than the indicative form was. Sometimes it can still be true, and we're going to use the um, uh, something that is, if it could be true, then we will still follow the typical grammar rules, singular subject with a singular verb, plural subject with a plural verb. But first, let's look at something that's contrary to fact. Miranda acts as if, as if she was or were the boss, but she's obviously not the boss. Since that's clearly contrary to fact, use the subjunctive case verb were. Jason wishes he were able to program, but he's not. He doesn't have a clue. Clearly contrary to fact, use the subjunctive case verb were, not was to go with the singular subject he. Okay, but if the statement could be true, then follow the traditional uh, rules for grammar. Singular subject with singular verb. Here's an if word. Doesn't mean that we're going to use a subjunctive case verb if it could be true. If Jose was in the audience, which is possible, I missed him. That's a possibility. So I will follow the traditional singular subject with singular verb. Also, if you have that clauses, uh, after if it, uh, that clause follows a verb expressing a command, a recommendation, a request, a suggestion, or requirement, use the subjunctive form of the verb be. The CEO required, recommended, um, suggested, requested, whatever that word is, if it is a command, recommendation, request, suggestion, required, use subjunctive. If the CEO required, requested, recommended, that comes before that phrase, that all board members be, use the subjunctive case verb be, not are, present at the meeting. Our manager required that all reports are re recommended or suggested that all reports be, so if there, that clause follows, it's a recommendation, a suggestion, a request, a requirement, use the subjunctive case verb be. And in addition to that, here's a motion. If a motion were made, or if it's second, if a motion was seconded, and if that clause follows, still continue use, to use the subjunctive form were or be. Manual move that the vote be taken. Sierra second the motion that the meeting be adjourned. Okay, let's move to the next part, which is irregular verbs. First, what is a regular verb? A regular verb is whenever you form uh, the past tense of a regular verb with D or ED, like jump, J-U-M-P, add ED to it to make it uh, past tense. Add ing to make it uh, future or present uh, tense. So there's nothing really different with the regular verb, but the irregular verb completely changes the spelling from the uh, regular tense to a past or to a future. For example, the word drive. I drive, uh, today I drive, yesterday I drove. Notice the spelling change to go to past tense. The future tense, tomorrow I will, back to the present, drive. Past participle, I'm going to add the words have 
or has to it, uh, or had. So I, in the past, I have driven, but the present participle, that's going to be an ing word. Next week, I am driving to work. Okay, so here are the tenses for irregular verbs. Present, past, past participle, add the have, has, or had to it. Or the present participle, add an ing to it. So there's your forms right there. My recommendation is to take the sheet that identifies uh, the present tense verb for an irregular verb, then the past tense, then you use the past participle if have, has, had, and is, are, was, were, be, being, and been is used before the word, use this column, the past participle. If it converts, uh, also you might have a, you will probably have a helping verb in front of the present, ten, uh, present participle as well, but they all change to I and G all the way down. So we have blow, blue, blown, and blowing. Break, broke, broken, and breaking. Bring, brought, brought, sometimes they're the same, and bringing. Build, built, built in the past participle, and building. Look at this one. Burst, 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 bursting. That one is very easy to use, but we make a lot of mistakes with those as well. Here is came, uh, uh, come in the uh, present tense, came in the past, come back in the past participle, if it has have, has, or had in front of it, and then coming uh, in the present uh, progressive. There's several of those listed on uh, two pages of irregular verbs. You can also check your dictionary to uh, determine uh, what all the forms are if you cannot remember them. This has been drilled into you so much that you probably know most of those. Drink, drank, drunk, and drinking. Uh, we use that one uh, incorrectly from time to time. We'll look at some of the examples of those in the reinforcement exercises at the end of the chapter. Okay, this next section is uh, lie and lay. With lie and lay, we have to know the difference between a transitive verb and an intransitive verb. Okay, I've included this in the uh, learning management system so you can download a copy of this for yourself. Uh, but transitive verbs have both active and passive voice. In active voice, it will take an object. I believe I put that right there. In passive voice, it will not take an object. For example, okay, in active voice, Angela wrote the report. Okay, in passive voice, the report was written by Angela. Okay, we use mostly in business writing active voice because it's a it's a voice of reason. It's a voice that sounds specific and tells us exactly what we need to do. It gets to the point a little bit more click, quickly. So if it's good news, if it's neutral, then certainly this is the voice that we want to use. But if it's something that could be negative or it could be condescending to the, uh, the recipient of our statement, then we may want to convert it to passive voice to show a little bit more respect to the actor since uh, uh, since we, they may not have done a really good job. So in active voice, the subject is Angela, and she wrote, and why did she write? She wrote a report, which is a direct object that receives the action of the verb wrote. Angela, is it possible for the subject, the actor, to write a report? Absolutely. Since uh, here it takes an object, Angela report, uh, wrote the report, there's your object right there. We know that the verb wrote is a transitive verb because it's active voice and it takes an object. Well, the word written is also a transitive verb, but it's in passive voice. So the report is your subject, was written, and then by Angela is a prepositional phrase. Okay, now we have to look at the subject again and ask the question, is it possible for the subject to write a report? 
No, it's not possible for the report to write itself. It has to be done by something or someone else. So the subject's being acted upon by something or someone else. So if it's in passive voice, it is definitely a transitive verb. If your verb is in passive voice, I'll repeat that again. If it's in passive voice, it is a transitive verb. Furthermore, if it's an active voice and takes an object, it's also a transitive verb. Now, in transitive verbs, it's an active voice only. Passive voice does not exist. But the key component here is an active voice. It will not take an object. So if I said the word, I listened, I listened to the report. I is your subject, listened is your verb, and to the report is the um, prepositional phrase. So is it an active voice? That's the first thing we have to determine. Is it possible for I, me to listen to something? Absolutely. So the subject is a doer of the action. If that be the case, then I have to look, okay, does it take an object? No, because this is in a prepositional phrase, so it does not, it's active voice and does not take an object, so therefore it must be um, intransitive verb. And then passive voice does not exist, so I can't even turn it around. Listen is an intransitive verb. Okay, that brings us to the lie and lay saga. Okay, with the, uh, the lie and lay, we make more errors in this particular uh, use of words than probably most other uh, combinations of words. Lie and lay. Uh, first of all, as a transitive verb, Notice how I capitalize the A right there, meaning lay is L-A-Y in the present tense. Remember, transitive verbs are active with object and passive without object. And so notice the A, it's prevalent all the way across for transitive verbs, A, 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 and A. So it's lay, laid, laid, and laying. And with the past participle, it's going to have a helping verb as well as the present participle. But the present participle is going to be an ing word. Lay, laid, laid, and laid. I will take an object with these, or if it's passive voice, it's still a transitive verb. In transitive verb, uh, I begins with the I. I capitalize the I right there. Cannot find a better mnemonic on this particular one other than knowing that the intransitive verb begins with I, lie, L-I-E. And then the past tense is, surprisingly, lay. Well, if it's present tense as a transitive verb and a past tense as an intransitive verb, that's where the awkwardness really comes into play. Uh, so if the, uh, the word in question does not take an object in active voice, then certainly the past tense would be lay. Um, past participle, along with the helping verbs, is lane, and then also in addition to more helping verbs of the present participle, plus the ing ending, is lying. So it's lie, L-I-E, lay, lane, and lying. At the end of the chapter, there are some examples of the lie and lay. Let's take a look at those. Just a few of them. It appears in section C in the reinforcement exercises. And it identifies the, uh, the present, which also, by the way, uh, right, this one's a transitive verb, and this one's an intransitive verb. 
Uh, intransitive, taking an object, it means to place. And then in uh, the intransitive verb, lie means to rest. And uh, so here's lay, laid, laid, and laying for the transitive verb. And then lie for the intransitive verb is lie, lay, and then lane and lying. We're going to have have, has, or had, or one of the other helping verbs, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, and been, to be associated with um, the past participle and the present participle, but add I and G to the present participle. So now let's take a look at this question. At the beginning, pull this up. At the beginning of the meeting, all the participants laid or laid their cell phones. So participants is the subject, and they laid verb, and now you can ask the question, laid what or who? They laid phones. So phones is a direct object. Is it possible for a participant to lay or lay uh, their cell phone? Absolutely, so it's active voice. If it's active voice uh, and it takes an object, we know that it's a transitive verb. So participants and um, past tense at the beginning of the meeting. It happened in the past. It's past tense, so when you go into the past tense column, it has to be this particular form right there, lay, letter B. And then uh, Keisha had to lay or lie down until the dizziness passed. Well, down is a where statement, and it describes where something is located, which is an adverb. So that's not an object. So Keisha had to, and then this is a um, infinitive, had to lay or lie, and it does not take an object in this particular uh, case. It goes with the had, so it has to be a past participle. So our uh, question, no, it's not a past participle in this particular case. Uh, let's go back. She had to lay or lie down until the dizziness passed. She had to lie. Where is it? Right there. In the present. Keisha had to lie down until the dizziness passed. It's happening in the present, even though it had the verb had in this particular case. So had to lie down, which is letter B. Okay, let's move over to the next page. And please lay or lie the foundation um, for your presentation and the introduction. So you is your subject, please, and then lay or lie, whichever one that's going to be. Foundation, since that's going to be the object, is it thought possible for you to lay or lie something? Absolutely. So it's an active voice and it takes an object. So we, let's go up here to the transitive. Uh, I'll put VT for transitive and VI for intransitive because that's the way it's identified in many of your dictionaries. And we'll start with uh, lay, laid, laid, and laying. And then uh, lie for the intransitive, lay, lane, and lying. Okay, so uh, please lay or lie the foundation. It takes an object. It's in the uh, present tense, so we are going to lay a foundation, which is letter A. Okay, then number 114, the contracts have been lying or laying in her inbox for some time. So contracts is your subject, have been laying or lying is your verb phrase in her inbox for some time, or two prepositional phrases. So is it possible for the contracts to be in an inbox? Absolutely. So it's an active voice, but it take, doesn't take an object. Since it doesn't take an object in active voice, it's intransitive. So it's going to be out of this column. It's have been, and it's progressive. It's uh, ing, so it's a participle. So we're going to use lying, which is letter A. In fact, they had laid or laid there for more than a week. Okay, they is your subject, had, laid, or laying. There is not an object. For more than a week is a prepositional phrase. There, it's 
it's possible for them to lie there or lay there. So it's active voice with no object. Somebody used the intransitive form and um, they had laid or lain. There's the verb had in front of it. So I'm going to use one of these two sections. And it's not the ing, so uh, it's going to be this particular. It's going to be laid or lain. And they had lain. Oops, lain. I'm sorry, marked the wrong one. Lain there for more than a week. Uh, the trainer told his dog to lay or lie down. Down is not an object. It's an adverb telling where. And so it's um, um, present. Present tense told his dog to lay or lie down and does not take an object, so we're going to use lie, letter B. Please lay or lie your hand on the Bible and take the oath. You please lay or lie what? Your hand. Hand is your direct object, so it's active voice that takes an object. So therefore, um, it's present tense. We are going to lay, letter A. Last night she lay or laid on the couch, that's a prepositional phrase, for hours. It's another prepositional phrase. Last night she lay or laid, no object, and it's possible for her to do that, so it's in the active uh, voice with no object, so it has to be an intransitive verb. It's in past tense, and so she lay there, letter A, the past tense. Some people risk developing skin cancer because they insist on laying or lying in the sun. In the sun is a prepositional phrase, and um, it's an active voice, so it has to be intransitive since it does not take an object. It's an ing, so it's this one right here, letter B. Whoops, did I spell that wrong? Oh, I marked the wrong one. That's why I was going, wow, something's really wrong with this one. Uh, lying in the sun, letter B. Okay, now finally, uh, suffering from negative publicity. Sea world is laying or lying plans. There's your direct object. Is laying or lying what or who? Your object is there, and it's possible for sea world to uh, lay or lie those plans. We're going to go with the transitive, which is laying, letter A. Okay. Interestingly enough, the next area is sit and set. Sit is spelled S-I-T, so it's intransitive, so it will be uh, active and will not take an object. Uh, the word set is considered to be transitive, and its past tense is sat. And then its uh, present participle is sitting, or setting rather. Um, fewer issues really arise with the words sit and set and rise and raise. Interestingly enough, because of lie and lay, for intransitive, L-I-E, and then same thing with um, sit and sat, I is intransitive, and then I and rise is intransitive. And so set, lay, and raise are all transitive verbs. So that clarifies that one easier. And then also, when you're uh, composing these word usages in a sentence, they're much more easily understood than the lie and lay. Creates fewer problems. Okay, uh, highlight one more area at the end of the chapter. There are uh, progressive and perfect tenses. We generally don't have many issues with those unless uh, uh, we have uh, a non-native speaker, and this is where they may have a few more problems. This is something that they had to focus on a little bit more. But for native speakers, we generally don't have that much of an issue with the uh, progressive and perfect tenses. 
But what they are, progressive tenses are used to show continuous or repeated actions. Continuous or repeated. Um, the present progressive tense describes ongoing actions that are happening now. The past progressive tense describes ongoing actions that occurred when? In the past, usually as another action was taking place. And the future progressive tense describes ongoing actions that will take place in the future. Form the progressive tenses by adding a form of to be to the present participle, ing, form of the verb. And we'll look more specifically at that in the next chapter as well. So here's some examples of those. We are importing in the present many of our products from China. So it expresses an action in progress for the present progressive. Okay, this one, we were sitting down to dinner. Okay, that happened in the past, so it's going to be past. It's an ING word, so it's uh, past progressive. Uh, when we lost power. So it's one action that occurred at the same time or previous to another past action. And then they will be receiving the announcement shortly. Uh, that's in the future. Future progressive with the ING word. Um, perfect tenses are used to show actions that are already completed uh, or they're perfected. The present perfect tense describes actions that began in the past and have continued to the present. The past perfect tense describes past actions that took pla place before another past action. And the future perfect tense describes actions that will take place before other future actions. Form progressive tenses by adding a form of to have to the past participle form of the verb, as you can see in the next section. So here's the national debt has increased substantially. So we have the present uh, perfect tense expresses an action just completed or perfected. Uh, the check had cleared the bank before I canceled payment. So it cleared before the cancellation. So it's past perfect tense shows an action finished before another action in the past. Or the polls have been closed two hours when the results are uh, will have been closed two hours when the results are telecasting, meaning that in the future, one action before another. Um, so it goes on to explain future perfect tense indicates action that will be completed before another future action. And uh, gives the uh, overall um, overview right there. Okay, the FAQs at the end of the chapter. Take a look at the FAQs at the end of the chapter. This concludes chapter 5.